Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Rogers, and tonight I'm going to speak on form criticism. So this is from Reasonable Faith Adelaide, and it's being recorded on the 10th of September 2020. So welcome. Um, this is a structure of what I'd like to actually uh, talk on. Um, pardon me while I just um, readjust the screen. Uh, okay. Um, so the, this is a structure of what I'd like to talk on. Um, the first, what is form criticism? It's history, arguments for, arguments against, and um, is the New Testament placed on eyewitness testimony? By the way, I could just see Wendy's face in the screen. Is that the same situation for everybody else? No. You can see mine, can you? Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Um, right, so we'll move on. Um, first of all, um, form criticism. Yes, this is a structure. What is form criticism? History, arguments for, arguments against, and is the New Testament based on eyewitness testimony? Now, uh, form criticism is a branch of Biblical criticism. So what is biblical criticism? Well, bi biblical criticism is primarily analysing the Bible in various ways. So it's not necessarily criticising the Bible. So the term biblical criticism can be misleading. Um, but it grew out of the Enlightenment and initially they concentrated on the quest for the historical Jesus. So they were looking for the, what was Jesus really like behind the Gospels. So the major branches of biblical criticism are textual criticism, source criticism, form criticism, and literary criticism. So textual criticism is just trying to get the best possible uh, text in the original language. And um, so for the Old Testament, that is primarily the Hebrew language. And for the New Testament, all of it was written in Greek. And so they want to get back to the... Um, Original Greek that was written by the authors. Um, source criticism is trying to work out uh, where the authors got their material from. Um, for instance, with um, the uh, Gospels, uh, the current the popular theory is that uh, both Matthew and Luke used Mark, and also another um, document called Q. And they also had their other sources. So source um, criticism is trying to identify the prior written sources. Form criticism is what we're going to talk about tonight. And literary criticism is just analysis of the literary styles and what we can actually learn from that. So form criticism, what is form criticism? Um, form criticism um, is an English translation of the German word form Geschichte. Uh, so it was developed by German scholars after World War I, so in the 1920s. Initially, it was applied to the Old Testament and then later on to the New Testament. So the basic uh, idea is it classifies units of scripture by their literary pattern or form type. And then they trace each type to its period of oral transmission. So uh, initially, um, straight after... Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, there were no written, adopt, written New Testament uh, for uh, the first uh, few years, and so everything was transmitted orally. So uh, it's debatable how long that uh, oral period was. Uh, the dating of the Gospels is something people discuss and debate. But it uh, did uh, certainly uh, proceed for a while where <laughs> all transmission was oral. Um, so the purpose of form criticism is to determine the life and thought of development of the literary tradition. Um, now we talk about units or form types of the Gospels. So units are short, coherent sections in the Gospels. So you'd actually be quite familiar with this, with the sermons in church. Um, that quite often you... So the minister reads out a passage, a coherent passage of uh, scripture, and then preaches his sermon on that passage. So um, this is those are the sort of units that we're actually talking about. 
Um, but examples of form types are, say, parables or sayings of Jesus. And you know, to use uh, the uh, form critics terminology, they classified some as legends or myths, and um, or there's deeds, then there's narratives, and they also particularly look at passion narratives. So now uh, I'll have a look about the historical development of form criticism. And the first person we'll be looking at is William Reed. And uh, initially form criticism started with the Old Testament. And so we'll look at those characters. And then later on, the form critics moved across the New Testament. And so we're gonna discuss each of those people. William Reed lived between 1859 to 1906. And there is his pretty picture. So he was a German Lutheran uh, theologian, and he specialized in what is called the messianic secret in the Gospel of Mark. And um, so in Mark, um, Jesus doesn't come out and over overtly say, I am the Messiah. Um, it's a developing revelation as you move through it. Uh, but um, William Reed claimed that this was an invented apologetic device. It didn't originate with Jesus, but something that the writers, you know, that the gospel writer Mark invented. And it was purpose was to explain the absence of clear messianic claims from Jesus, and also to try and explain away um, why he wasn't accepted by the Jewish leadership. So uh, he also denied that the author um, of Mark was a companion of Peter, which contradicts what um, the earliest church father papers said about this. And um, but his teaching and assumptions were accepted by the major founders of form criticism. So you can see uh, initially it's um, a, a fairly skeptical approach to the Bible, to the New Testament. So um, the person who invented uh, form criticism was Hermann Gunkel, or Gunkel, uh, who lived from uh, 1862 to 1932. Uh, he was a German Old Testament scholar, and he was descended from Lutheran pastors. And he was also uh, actively involved in what is called the History of Religion School, uh, which was um, a school which was uh, claiming that a lot of Christianity was based Oh, on the Old Testament, but also on pagan religion. So they are looking for parallels in pagan religion to explain the character of Jesus. Um, this guy is Martin Noth uh, from 1902 to 1968, so he's more recent. And he specialised in pre-exile pre history of Israel. So the exile was um, from, from around about 587, 597 BC. Um, to around about 70 years afterwards. So um, he was looking at, uh, prior to that period, he, he was looking at the history of Israel. So he was a German scholar of the Hebrew Bible, um, and he claimed that the 12 tribes of Israel did not exist prior to the time of Joshua. And um, he supplemented what is called the documentary uh, hypothesis, uh, and that basically was that the uh, first five books of the Bible, or the Torah, uh, were not written by Moses, but constructed by four different types of authors. So he worked in that domain. Um, and he claimed that the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, was composed of traditional material about the historical experiences of Israel. And he also claimed that Deuteronomy was written in the seventh century BC. So he was kind of spraying off what is a kind of a conventional scholarship. Uh, the third character was uh, Gerhard von Rad, who lived from 1901 to 1971. He was initially a Lutheran pastor and later a professor in various German un uh, universities. And he was uh, a strong promoter of applying form criticism to the Old Testament. So now we move uh, to those who were involved in the New Testament. And the first character is uh, Carl Ludwig Schmidt, who lived from 1891 to 1956. He was a German Protestant theologian. Um, 
and um, he was um, professor in the University of Basel in Switzerland. And uh, he claimed that the Gospels consist of short units. Well, I guess a lot of you would agree with that, because <laughs> um, they do. Um, but he stated that uh, the Gospel units were not in chronological order. And um, again, this is not particularly uh, controversial, uh, because if you actually look at the ordering of um, passages in Mark and, um, and Matthew or Luke, uh, quite often they switch them around. So they don't actually follow the same order of passages. However, where he, uh, a bit more controversial claim was he claimed that this is evidence that the units were based on an oral tradition uh, and that the gospels are snapshots of the oral tradition. Uh, the next guy is Martin Franz de Belius uh, from 1883 to 1947. He was a New Testament professor uh, at the University of Heidelberg, and he wrote this book, Form Criticism of the Gospels. And he wrote that in 1919. Um, he claimed that the earliest forms of the Gospels were short sermons, uh, and the final forms were modif modifications of that to meet the needs of the Christian community. And he claimed it was impossible to describe Jesus with any uh, historical certainty. So I think you can see where this is going. Uh, this is Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, he lived from 1884 to 1976. So he lived to a ripe old age of around about 92. And he is the major player. He is the most influential exponent of form criticism. He was a German Lutheran theologian. And he was the son of a Lutheran minister. He was professor of the New Testament at the University of Marburg. Uh, he was a critic of liberal theology, which may seem strange because he sounds very liberal himself. And he had what we call an existentialist interpretation of the New Testament. So what that means is that he focused on Christian experience rather than history. So just to explain the term existentialism, um, existentialism basically says that life inherently has no meaning, um, and that life is meaningless, and so we have to actually create our own meaning. And um, uh, his position was that the historical certainty of Jesus' acts is not really important. It's the theological importance that matters. So here is uh, Bultmann's theology. His approach was to demythologize the New Testament. So he uh, viewed a lot of the New Testament as mythology. And so we have to get behind the mythology to actually find what it means. He claimed that all miracles are unhistorical. And he uh, said that they're kind of metaphors rather than history. And so he wanted to replace the supernatural with existential meaning, finding meaning in our experience. So his aim was to make the Gospels acceptable to the modern scientific audience of his time. Uh, so he believed that the modern scientific uh, person would not accept the miraculous, and so he had to do mythologize. So our aim, should, uh, the aim of Christians should be to seek authentic existence as human beings. And so he wanted to strip the Gospels of their first century mythical world picture uh, because our thinking is irrevocably formed by science. So the Jesus narratives are theology in story and are spoken in the language of myth. Now he actually, is, um, he wasn't against Christianity at all. He considered himself a believer and he thought he was doing Christianity a favor by all the things uh, that he suggested. So uh, oh, I scratch my head. Did he actually believe in God? Well, he did. But this is um, his view of God. God is active in our lives. I don't think we have any argument with that. Um, God is hidden and mysterious. Well, uh, yes, we can accept that. But we also believe that God is revealed. But he said, if we are humble, the mysteries are revealed. And he uh, was revealed in his way of interpretation. 
Um, so here are the implications of uh, Bultmann's teaching. Um, he said, the modern mind is scientific, and uh, as modernists, we believe that everything that happens, happens by natural causes. Miracles are impossible, and so the miracle in accounts must be unhistorical. Um, the gospel cite numerous miracles by Jesus, so the gospels must be unhistorical. So uh, we are to seek an explanation for the unhistorical accounts. And so he said, his conclusion was that the Gospels must be the result of an evolving Chinese whispers in the oral tradition. So I'm sure most of you will agree with that. All right. Now, this is to test that you've been listening. So uh, I'd like some response uh, from some of you guys. Um, so what are common factors with the founders of form criticism? Well, many seem to have come from a Lutheran background. Yes. Good girl. Full marks for you. What else? They uh, seem to be German. Yes. <laughs> I hope, I'm, not, I'm just wondering how many German people are listening to this. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, um, there are a few of us. <laughs> right, Schroeder's. <laughs> I won't mention the war. Good. <laughs> They seem very committed to a naturalistic interpretation of the universe, that yeah. God at best is a deistic God, not a theistic God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you'd be done very, very well, because I feel pleased. They're I mean, generally highly qualified university people. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. That's a bit close to the bone there, Jeff. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll move on. Um, these are uh, some of the assumptions of form criticism. Um, the stories were maintained by an oral tradition. The traditions evolved like Chinese whispers. The traditions were invented like European fairy tales. And they were adapted to the needs of churches at the time. Christian communities had no interest in history. Uh, the gospel authors, also called the evangelists, captured the anonymous oral traditions in the written Gospels. So the Gospels are not based on eyewitness testimony and the Gospels have little historical value. Um, and they valued the parables and saying of Jesus as those that are most likely to be historical. That's because the parables and sayings of Jesus didn't have a miraculous element. Um, their oral model was based on a theory of Jewish folklore transmission that was current at the time. So that was the best model that they had at the time. And uh, they also commonly believed that the early church was heavily in influenced by the Hellenistic Greek culture. So it's adapting to the audience. Um, this is a form critical method. Um, so the first step was to identify the um, genre or form of the textual unit, and the textual units are also called, um, each one was called a pericope. So a pericope is a short, coherent unit of thought suitable for public reading, which is still our practice today. So we have public reading of the Gospels and we just look at short units. Uh, and the uh, um, aim was to identify the sits in labor, which means the sociological setting uh, so that is the situation in life, but at the time of writing. So the, uh, I'll expand on that. The church has formed saints to suit their needs um, and um, the, the, their understanding of the oral tradition was based on their understanding of the folklore. Um, so uh, the latest step is how do the pericopes uh, contribute to the text as a whole, and then to determine which units go back to Jesus or not. So they, they look at all these um, units and they say, uh, all right, uh, does this, is this what Jesus actually said or is, was that invented along the way? Um, sits im Leben, uh, this is a German statement and it means setting in life. Um, and it's sometimes misunderstood um, because 
uh, it is the alleged context when the text was created, not the setting in which the reported events occurred. So Sitzem Laban is the um, setting in life when the authors wrote it down, not the setting in life uh, attached to the deeds of Jesus. So it's um, uh, quite different. Now, what are arguments for form criticism? Well, at the time, it was based on the best theories of folklore and oral tradition at the time. Now, um, this is kind of more current. Just ask yourself this question. Do current churches adapt the message to suit their sits in Laban? So when, when the, the in churches, do they actually modify or um, filter their message to suit their current needs or to suit the feelings of uh, um, society at the time? Well, I, I, I said yes, it's often done. Um, that, um, so you can see people doing it today. So you ask the question, well, if Christians did it, do it today, did they do it back then? Mm. Um, I think the answer is yes and no. It's not just yes, it's yes and no. Some do, particularly yeah. liberal churches, yeah. and others don't. Yeah. Others seek to be um, faithful to what it was originally. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, so I, 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 I shouldn't say that yes is an absolute thing. It's a, it is actually say yes and no. Uh, but it is a temptation that we do face. Yeah. Hmm. Now, also, Bultmann himself is a, a good example of it. Did Bultmann adapt his theology and methodology to suit the audience of his time? Well, yes, <laughs> he did. <Yeah. laughs> mm. All right, rules of folk, uh, folklore. Uh, folk critics are claimed to find laws of development of oral tradition. Uh, but um, this is kind of part of the criticism. Uh, but uh, criticism of form criticism. But it is just, we're getting some funny sounds come through. So, uh, to, to some of you disable your um, or microphones, please. All right, okay. Um, yeah, so just turn them on if you want to speak. Um, yeah, so uh, form critics claim to find laws of development of oral tradition, um, but it's now believed that there are no such laws. This is a claim of a, uh, a leading theologian um, called uh, Ed Sanders. Um, written accounts follow common patterns, but um, oral development is far more variable and it varies between cultures. And um, so you can find all sorts of different styles of oral development of stories in different cultures, and it's all over the place. So you can't say that there's just one common law of um, oral tradition that you can apply back uh, to what happened in New Testament times. And it just depends a lot on cultural attitudes. So they, if the rules of folklore were, were uh, speculative and, and basically wrong. Comments on, uh, so here's some comments uh, from recent scholars on form criticism. If the form critics are right, the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection. This is by a guy called, who, who was actually a form critic himself, Vincent Taylor. Uh, another one, the analogy between the development of the gospel pericopi, so that's the actual plural of pericope, um, and folklore needed reconsideration because of developments in folklore studies. It was less easy to assume the steady growth of an oral tradition in stages. The length of time needed for the laws of oral tra transmission to operate was greater than taken by the Gospels. Even the existence of such laws was questioned. And uh, the last comment, today it is no ex exaggeration to claim that the whole spectrum of main assumptions underlying Bultmann's synoptic tradition must be considered suspect. So mm -hmm. that's the views of uh, some of the uh, modern scholars. Uh, critiques of form crit criticism. Um, the uh, critiques have been about the nature of the oral tradition, 
Uh, form critics use the best model available at the time, as I've already stated, but that model cannot be supported now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a wide variety in oral societies, so any sort of generalisation is hazardous. And um, the oral nature of the oral tradition is uh, very much uh, specific to each culture. Oral traditions are not necessarily communal, uh, which was one of the assumptions of form criticism. It was sort of transmitted by communities, but rather than uh, by key individuals. Individual tradents, uh, a trident is a term that's uh, often used when discussing form criticism, but a, a trident is an individual who controlled the tradition. So the individual tradents are significant. In other words, it very much depends on the key individuals who are, dr are driving it. Um, the form critics assume that all oral societies have no interest in the past, and that's simply not true. Oral societies often distinguish between fact and fiction. And when they're dealing with fact, uh, usually they uh, are far more careful about faithful reproduction. So there's uh, some freedom of expression, uh, but the essentials of the content have to be um, maintained. And um, um, African societies still uh, do a lot of transmission by oral tradition, and so they still operate in this way. So exact memorization is common, and quite often it, this, um, the, the message that they're um, trying to maintain is entrusted to trained guardians. Now, so, so the questions, uh, one of the things that um, um, the form critics claim was that the gospels were not based on eyewitness testimony. Um, you can see this with, um, say, Bultman's approach. Um, uh, Bible, uh, the Gospels contain lots of miracles. Miracles don't happen. They have to be un um, historical. So the Gospels can't be based on eyewitness testimony. It just must be a growing legend. But are the Gospels based on eyewitness testimony? Um, I, uh, in preparing this, um, well, I was actually stimulated to talk on this um, by reading the, uh, a book by uh, Richard Borkham. Uh, so here's his pretty picture. Uh, he's born in 1946. He is an English Anglican scholar in historical theology and New Testament studies. And his first qualifications were was as uh, in history. So he's primarily a historian. Uh, and the book he wrote was Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And um, there are uh, various YouTube interviews with uh, Richard Borkham uh, on the, uh, the YouTube. And uh, I've listed a couple there. Well, obviously, you're not going to be able to record it. You can click on your monitor if you like and see if it works, but I don't fancy your chances. But uh, if you want to find them, just uh, Google Richard Borkham videos and that these sort of things, links will come up, and they're quite interesting. So uh, here is his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Um, so the uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, the Gospels, as eyewitness testimony. I'm just going to crow, shut my outlook. <laughs> um, the, now, this is a very highly cited and controversial book. So I, I looked it up on Google Scholar, and last time I looked, there were 802 citations. So that's quite a lot of citations for a book. And um, various people have called it a paradigm shift in New Testament studies. And one person said, has claimed that this is a single most important book to have been written on the historical Jesus in decades. Mm. And um, so um, uh, naturally it has um, uh, caused quite a diverse response and some people love it and some people hate it. So um, I'd recommend you read it for yourself and <laughs> see whether you love or hate it. But it, uh, yeah. But it is, um, I said it was acceptable, it's quite easy to read, so it's not uh, obscure uh, scholarly language. Right. All right. Uh, but I'll jump to the conclusions of the book. <laughs> this is a conclusion. Uh, the, the Jesus of the Gospels is the real Jesus. The eyewitnesses were still around when the Gospels were written. <coughs> Um, the Synoptic Gospels were based 
on eyewitness testimony. And only John, he says that only John was written by an eyewitness um, and the uh, rest, the synoptics were based on eyewitness testimony. So he doesn't believe that uh, Matthew uh, is um, uh, the same, that the Matthew, the um, tax collector wrote Matthew. Um, and he said that the gospels are oral history, not oral tradition. And those terms will be explained. Uh, all right. Um, the authenticity of the apostolic uh, eyewitnesses in the New Testament. Um, uh, now, um, this is kind of the, um, um, how the church um, or the uh, early church fathers um, this came to decide on the canon. Uh, the canon is the list of 27 books in the New Testament. And um, uh, so this is uh, their criteria for choosing what books actually went to the New Testament, especially the Gospels. So there were numerous Gospels around. So the um, canon was finalised in um, late in the fourth, um, fourth century. So it's around about 387, 397 AD. There were a couple of councils. There was the... Um, uh, Synod of Hippo and the Council of Carthage. So they were the two church uh, groups where they actually finalised formally the contents of the New Testament. But they, um, so there were many gospels around and a lot of them were written late in the second century and some of them were a bit crazy. Uh, so only the gospels that contained authentic eyewitness testimony were accepted into the New Testament canon. So that was uh, their primary criteria. Um, and um, so uh, being eyewitness based was one of their criteria for accepting uh, which gospels were included. So they had three criteria and they're listed here. Um, firstly, they, they must derive from the apostolic age, uh, which ended roughly 100 AD in our, our dating terms but they didn't have that calendar at the time. So they didn't choose 100 AD because it was a nice round number, uh, but it, it, it just uh, approximated uh, to the um, death of the last eyewitness. Um, so uh, for instance, the Muratorian canon was one of the first uh, canons um, that excluded the shepherd of Hermas. Now the shepherd of Hermas, uh, there's nothing wrong with it really. Um, uh, it's what it says is quite in line with what the rest of the New Testament says, but they excluded it because it was too late. It was from the second century. Um, also, it must be derived from the circle of disciples of Jesus. And it must also uh, conform with the teachings of the mainstream church. Now, that sounds a bit circu um, um, circular, uh, because um, uh, the mainstream church, it well, sounds as though the mainstream churches uh, will just include what we agree with. Uh, but uh, it's um, a little bit um, clearer than that. When you actually read all these um, other documents, it's, uh, uh, the New Testament documents are in a class of their own and the uh, other stuff does look very suspect. So it is quite easy to tell uh, whether a teaching is authentic or not. Um, apostolicity, um, that sounds fancy, but it, uh, it basically it means, um, was it derived from the apostles, the 12 apostles? So apostolicity, apostolicity was um, primary criterion for acceptance. So the uh, four gospels were considered apostolic from the earliest times. So that it uh, must mean that it's uh, um, derived in some way from the 12 apostles. Um, so um, it must be soundly based on Jesus' closest disciples. And um, for this reason, other second century or forged gospels were rejected. Now, um, Mark in actual fact was uh, very little used in the second century 
but it was included. Um, the reason why it wasn't very little used is that because people um, had the opinion that what's in Mark is in Matthew and Luke. And Matthew and Luke had extra material, so why bother with Mark? But Mark was still kept uh, because it, um, they considered it apostolic because they believed it was derived from Peter. Um, but what were the impacts of form criticism on the apostolic claims? Well, the, um, the impact was that the testimony of the church, early church fathers was often ignored. Uh, and um, because the early church fathers said, these gospels are derived from eyewitnesses. Well, that thesis didn't suit the form critics. And so they um, said, oh, gee, the church fathers must be wrong. So form criticism disassociated the gospels from the eyewitnesses. Uh, and um, uh, just a comment that this ended up being fundamentally misleading approach to the gospels. And uh, the, the form criticism, its influence is waning but it still continues on to this day. Now, um, I've mentioned oral history and oral tradition. Uh, so uh, oral tradition is, um, this is a kind of a definition of it. Uh, its features are that it is maintained by retelling stories within communities, and it's not based on eyewitness testimony. Whereas, um, um, whereas at that time, what was called oral history, so by the standards of uh, writing history at the time, had to be either uh, written by involved participants or by interviewing eyewitnesses. So both those forms were considered valid forms of oral history. So an example was um, Josephus. Uh, Josephus uh, wrote a book on the Jewish wars and he was actually a soldier. Uh, he was an officer within the uh, Israeli uh, defense. And so he was an involved participant. And so that uh, made him uh, to be considered a good source for writing oral history. Um, but also like Josephus couldn't be everywhere. And so he had to get the rest of his information by interview interviewing others. So he um, would have interviewed involved participants. Um, so, um, so that was a, a valid form. And so um, the claim by Borkham is that the uh, Gospels are not oral tradition, they are oral history. Uh, oral tradition. Um, it still did occur Oral tradition, in a sense, uh, did occur uh, prior to the writing of the Gospels uh, from the point of view that the message was passed on from person to person, from community to community. And um, uh, so initially there was an, uh, certainly a, a significant oral element. So Christian communities maintained stories of Jesus prior to the Gospels. Um, but... Um, more modern views are that they, they were more reliable than what the form critics claimed. Um, as, uh, societies that rely on oral tradition take steps to preserve accuracy, um, or they did then, because uh, there were many people to correct the story and the eyewitnesses were still available. So now I'm going to talk about um, evidence for eyewitness testimony and um, uh, the first two are uh, uh, some of the points that Richard Borkham um, stressed. Uh, he mentioned named minor participants and also what he called the inclusio. Uh, but I'm actually going to look at what do the authors claim themselves? Named minor participants. Um, within the uh, Gospels, the major uh, characters such as political or priestly characters are named. Examples of this are Pilate, Herod, and Caiaphas. But most of the minor characters are anonymous. But some minor characters are named. And um, uh, here are some examples. People like Bartimaeus, the blind man. Jairus, 
the synagogue leader, Jairus. Simon of Cyrene, uh, the, the uh, man who carried Jesus' cross. And it also mentions that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Um, then there's a story there too on the uh, road to Emmaus. One is known, that's um, Cleopas, but the other is not. Um, then there, uh, in particular, there are named women uh, who are mentioned for their crucifixion, burial, empty tomb, and first appearances, such as Mary Magdalene, Salome, or Salome, um, Joanna, etc., uh, Susanna. And um, when the key word that is used with those women is that they saw. Um, so it mentions them seeing th certain things. So they saw where um, Jesus' body was laid in the tomb. So um, what uh, Borkham uh, argues is that these named participants were probably members of the early church and were eyewitness sources for the Gospels. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Inclusio of eyewitness testimony. Inclusio is a Latin term, but you can see it means something about include. Uh, so this was a common literary technique at the time. So it's a bookend. So it means what happened right at the start and what happened right at the end. Mm. Um, and so uh, this is a device used in, in Mark. So the uh, Pope was claimed that uh, Mark was written by Mark, who was a, um, a follower of Peter. And what, he, what Mark wrote was a, kind of a, a summary of what Peter preached. But Simon, but you, it also seems evident by actually looking at the book of Mark and the prominence of Peter. So Simon Peter is the first disciple and the last person mentioned in Mark. So he's the disciple that bookended uh, the content of Mark. Um, also, um, the, the synoptics list the 12 disciples, um, so they're careful to list them, um, but some of them are not mentioned elsewhere in the rest of the text. Um, like there's James, uh, son of Alphaeus, or uh, Bartholomew. Uh, they, don't, they only appear in the list, and they're never mentioned in the, any of the narratives. So why did they list them? Um, they listed them because it was important because they're actually one of the sources for the Gospels. So uh, Mark's primary sources were probably what are called euphemistically the 12, but you'd have to exclude uh, Judas Iscariot, Iscariot from that. So there are actually 11 who are um, uh, uh, probably the sources, uh, but especially Peter. So, and his claim was that the Gospel of Mark, uh, Peter's so prominent in it that the Gospel of Mark was uh, as seen through Peter's eyes. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, I'm going to look at uh, basically um, uh, other evidence. So are they eyewitness accounts and are the eyewitness, uh, are the Gospels based on the eyewitness accounts? Uh, and we're going to look at uh, uh, what a guy called Papist said, then Luke, um, the Gospel of John, and John the Elder. So Papias was uh, Bishop of Hierapolis, which is uh, an ancient town in modern-day Turkey. And uh, he was writing at uh, about uh, the early 2nd century. And he uh, wrote a, a, a book in five parts, which was called Expositions of the Sayings of the Lord. Um, that document was around for a number of a uh, hun few hundred years, but it's since been lost and scholars would love to find it. But key parts of it are actually recorded uh, by some of the church fathers and the uh, most interesting parts were recorded by Eusebius in his church history. Um, but uh, he would have lived from around about 50 AD to um, probably 130 AD, some, somewhere over that period. Um, so he, as a young person, he uh, was in, within living memory of um, some of the apostles. 
Um, so he provides the earliest record about um, New Testament books and authorship uh, that we have uh, outside the Bible itself. And he said that Mark was Peter's interpreter. And so he recorded um, kind of the uh, pericope um, as preached by Peter, saying that this is a sort of material that he used. Um, and uh, so he mo Mark wrote as things were recounted by Peter. Um, however, um, Papias' testimony was incompatible with full criticism. So in the eyes of biblical critics, um, Papias lost credibility. They said, oh, he just got it wrong. Um, but his, um, what his testimony uh, does is to support evidences within the Gospels themselves. Um, now, um, the prologue to Luke is um, very interesting as well. So this is the first four verses of the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as um, they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Now, I skipped over some um, uh, bits which I had in brackets. When it says just as um, in the beginning of the second verse, so it's on the third line, that have been fulfilled among us just as, that is the word uh, kathos. So you've got there kappa, alpha, theta, omega, sigma on the end. So it's pronounced kathos. But uh, the, the just as is a little bit ambiguous in English, but kathos uh, mean, also means in the same way that. So what that actually means is that many have undertaken to draw up a account of the things that have been fulfilled uh, among us. Well, what did they write in their written accounts? They um, uh, wrote what the um, eyewitnesses and service, servants of the word um, handed down to them. So the, the written accounts were written just as um, the, um, they were handed down. And the other thing um, he says is they were handed down to us. So that is first, pers uh, first person plural. So Luke is actually um, putting him in that group. He's saying that um, uh, what was hand uh, that he was a recipient of what was handed down um, by the eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So that is a claim by Luke to be writing um, eyewitness testimony. Um, there's some other things that kind of occurred to me in looking at this. Um, in the beginning of the second bullet point, that's actually verse three. It says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Um, I was kind of initially suspected that uh, Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus probably indicates that he was a high ranking Roman, because um, that was typical way of uh, actually uh, addressing a Roman, uh, a high standing Roman person. Uh, and I was thinking that uh, Theophilus was probably the um, sponsor uh, for who funded um, a lot of Luke's work, but um, I kind of think seems to change my mind because um, he said, I too decided to write. So oh, okay. he's, uh, Luke is actually saying that he's writing on his own initiative uh, rather than uh, under instruction from Theophilus. So I think uh, Luke decided to write it. And uh, now having written it, he's added his uh, abstract at the beginning and um, uh, presented a copy to Theophilus. Uh, so is uh, Luke's prologue plausible? Uh, well, first of all, he talked about uh, many had undertaken to write accounts. 
Um, and um, so you can, and did Luke use written sources? Well, yes, he did, uh, because Luke actually um, used uh, a lot of Mark. So he used around about 50% of Mark. So he had a copy of Mark in some form, and um, he made use of it. So he, a part of his sources were a written source of Mark. And um, then there's also common material that is shared between Matthew and Luke. So a lot of them is agreement word for word, but it's not in Mark. Uh, so people actually suggest that there was another document that, uh, called Q, which is uh, short for Quell, which is German for source. And um, I believe that Luke and Matthew both had access to a written document called Q. So uh, the agreement between Luke and Matthew is too close for it to be oral. So they uh, actually believe there was a prior written account. So that is support for Luke's claim, basically to have consulted written sources. Um, now, uh, but uh, Luke also claims that he had access to eyewitnesses. And this is uh, supported by the we passages in Acts. And this is a favorite theme of mine. So uh, within the book of Acts, there are several places where um, he, or for a lot of the uh, Acts, he talks about what other people did and he uses he, they, whatever. And then at various points within the book of Acts, he swaps and goes into first person plural. So instead of talking about they, he says we. And there's, there's some quite distinct passages in Acts. Um, the last two, um, uh, start in 57 AD. Uh, and this, uh, so Paul's been roaming around uh, Asia and Macedonia and, um, and Greece and eventually decides to go back to Rome. Instead of going straight from Corinth to Rome, he decides to go up through Macedonia, passes through Philippi, and as he passes through Philippi, suddenly the wee passages start. And so from this, we can see that um, Luke accompanies Paul from Philippi to Jerusalem. So you have we, we all the way from Philippi uh, to Jerusalem. And that occurs between Acts 20, uh, 5 to 19. And so um, when uh, Paul arrives in Jerusalem, he decides to uh, exercise a vow. He goes to the temple, stirs up a riot. Um, he's arrested and jailed a, in Caesarea. And so at that point uh, of the riot, the wee passages stop. And then we have several chapters which discusses Paul's time in um, Caesarea. And uh, eventually Festus decides to send him off to Rome. And as soon as uh, he's sent off to Rome, so that's after two years of imprisonment. So this is 59 AD. Um, the wee passages start again, and it's wee, 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 all the way to Rome. Um, so from this, we see that Luke accompanies Paul to Rome. So that's chapters 27 and 28 of uh, Acts. So uh, Paul's in prison between 57 and 59 AD. What's Luke doing? Well, the last we hear, he's arrived in Jerusalem. So, um, so Luke was either in Jerusalem or the surrounding areas, and that would have been an ideal time for him to actually interview eyewitnesses. So it's plausible. Um, uh, Luke would have had uh, access to eyewitnesses for his gospel sources at this time. Um, now, how about the book of John? Um, was that uh, by an eyewitness or uh, someone who access to um, the eyewitness? Um, in the final chapter from verse 20, uh, it's got this. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who'd leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? So I'll skip a few verses, and then in verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So that is a claim that the person who wrote the book of John was the one who leaned against Jesus at the Last Supper. 
Um, so in the book of John is a claim to be direct eye testimony. Now, a lot of people may dispute that and um, say that this is a false claim, but that's what it claims. So there's an interesting, couple of interesting things about this, because it says in here, this was a disciple who leaned back, back against Jesus at the supper and had said. Um, but John, <laughs> the, the, the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, described the last supper, but John doesn't. <laughs> Uh, he substitutes the uh, washing of the disciples' feet. Uh, so e even though uh, the Gospel of John doesn't um, include the Last Supper, the author obviously knew about it because <laughs> uh, he refers to it. Um, uh, in actual fact, um, when it says this, this was the one who leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Um, that is not actually recorded in the synoptics. Um, like I said, the disciples were asking, um, who's going to betray you? But it didn't mention any single indiv individual. So he's actually referring back to something that in, an individual said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Um, now, and um, yeah, so the notes are there. The last supper is not recorded in John, neither is the bracketed section in verse 20. Mm. Right. Now, um, John the Elder. Um, as well as the Gospel of John, there are three epistles of John. The style uh, of the uh, style and themes of the three epistles are very much like John's Gospel. So it talks about loving one another, etc. So it seems like it's the same author. In the um, letters, in the Gospel of John, uh, uh, John self-identifies as the disciple whom Jesus loved. In uh, the second and third uh, epistles of John, he commences with the elder. He identifies as the elder. So um, it's uh, virtually unanimous that um, uh, the Gospel of John and the epistles of John were written by the same person. So they... Um, the disciple whom Jesus loved and the elder are one and the same person. Which is interesting when we look at the beginning of 1 John, uh, the first three verses. And so I've um, um, bulleted um, a lot of the, um, the phrases in the first few verses uh, to just emphasise what he's saying. So John the elder uh, claims to be a direct eyewitness in the most empirical manner. So here it is. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And the life appeared and we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. That which we proclaim to you, what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So um, just a note uh, about the dramatic style that's uh, apparent in the Greek. So you have that which, which is uh, repeated uh, four times in those uh, first couple of verses. Yeah. It's the Greek word hot. <coughs> so that which, uh, and he's uh, actually appealing uh, directly to empirical senses. So he's heard, seen with his eyes, looked at, and touched. Yeah. And um, then uh, he repeats it again later on. And we have seen it and testified to it. And he appeared to us. So he's being highly empirical and appealing to the senses. So surely <laughs> this is a claim to be a direct eyewitness. Yeah, so um, and he, it's very dramatic in the Greek. And there's a, a repeated use of that which, which is hot, and then and, which is the word chi in Greek. So, so a lot of this emphasis is uh, quite often lost in the English translation. But in the Greek, it is very, very dramatic. 
Um, so that's it. That's the end of the uh, um, presentation. So, Wendy, you can go to bed if you like. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the rest of you, um, there's um, uh, some questions for you to uh, consider, which we may be part of our discussion. Um, so, was it reasonable for the form critics to dismiss miracles? How is uh, knowledge of form criticism relevant to us? Uh, because like uh, for most people who are sitting in churches, they wouldn't have a clue <laughs> about what's gone um, on in history. Yeah. Um, so why should they care? Why should they bother? Um, and should we believe Luke and John in their claims to be based on eyewitness testimony? So at that point, I'll escape out of the presentation and um, hopefully I can control the Zoom session. Uh, I'll stop sharing the screen. And now you're all exposed. <laughs> or as many who want to be. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, sorry. So now it's so all open to all of you um, for, uh, to uh, ask questions or to uh, contribute comment. Comment. Uh, I've got uh, just uh, just before we do. Um, uh, uh, there's uh, some people actually put some comments or questions on chat, and so I'll just go through those. Um, as uh, from Brian, to, he says the early church fathers said that Matthew was written first. And Mark and Luke use Matthew, uh, not that Matthew and Luke use Mark. Though Luke, Luke would have known of both Matthew and Luke. What? Though Luke would have known of Matthew. Yeah, Matthew. I created myself in the next line, sorry. <laughs> Matthew and Mark, that is. Okay. Uh, all right. Do you want to speak to that, Brian? Uh, yeah, I um, did some research and spoke on this a reasonable faith a couple of years ago. And the reason why the Gospels appear in the order they do in our New Testament is because that is the order that the uh, early church fathers believed they were written. Um, and that uh, when Mark was in Rome with Peter, interpreting for Peter, uh, they had uh, a proto-early copy of Mark's Gospel with them, and they could use that and refer to that one. Uh, and then Mark wrote his Gospel based on Peter's preachings, as you had said, um, but they had reference to Matthew's original work. And Matthew had uh, supposedly taken uh, quite a few notes of things that Jesus had said um, while it was actually happening. Yeah, with um, the, well, the theory that I put forward um, is um, a popular one, but there's certainly many others. And um, the one that I um, uh, Put forward was the one that the form critics actually assumed, and um, uh, so they were actually dependent on that theory being right. <laughs> yeah, it was very popular for a while, but from what I have heard, um, it does not have the same level of uh, popularity as it did, say, fifty or hundred years ago. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think uh, the synoptic problems uh, are called a problem because it is a problem, and. Um, uh, so, uh, how do you actually explain um, the commonality between the three Gospels? And um, I don't think any uh, of the theories actually work for bulletproof. This far away from the actual events, no. Mm. All right. Um, now from Steve, uh, Stephen. C.S. Lewis was a, a, an agnostic professor of medieval English, uh, was challenged to read the Gospels and... Uh, Inetified, I think identified, they did not match the legend stories that he studied. Would you like to speak to that, Steve? Well, yes, okay. Um, it, it's quite a good link if you choose to read it. Um, and I guess we know C.S. Lewis is very much an apologetic in later life, but uh, one of the things that converted him to Christianity was an atheist uh, who he knew was outright atheist, walked into his room one day and said, I'm thinking that the Gospels actually read like history. And C.S. Lewis, who'd never read the Gospels, said, oh, oh yeah, right. And uh, But he thought he was challenged and he did read it. And remember, C.S. Lewis was a guy who studied myths and legends. He knew what they sounded like because he was a professor or at least a lecturer, I'm not quite sure at the time, at Oxford in 
uh, ancient literature, certainly in the English ancient literature, he could distinguish how a legend was written, how it was quite polished. So he made sure that it was a very convincing argument. He got to the Gospels and there were nothing like that. There were gaps and there were, you know, halts here and there. It sounded nothing like someone trying to form a story. And for him, that was, you know, a light bulb moment. And so there you go. Right. Anybody like to comment on Steve? Right, uh, from Eric. Uh, many verses in John read like eyewitness. No one else would bother to add these sorts of details. Do you want to talk to that, Eric? Uh, so particularly in the last few chapters, uh, we get um, where Peter and John uh, run to the tomb and it, and it says how how John got there first, but Peter went in first. And then uh, later on when they're, uh, when they, after the resurrection, when they see Jesus out when they're fishing and um, that and the way that John calls himself the disciple Jesus loved, um, that is kind of a bit awkward that you wouldn't put in unless, unless you were the writer even as the writer, it seems a bit awkward, but, but those, those, um, those things that uh, he, he wrote because he was there and he was telling the story and um, someone else uh, telling the story later from, from someone or if it was a made up story, they wouldn't bother to include details like that. Hmm. Okay, don't. It's open, Slado. Anybody say anything within reason? <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, uh, the, the question of belief is a, is, a, is a real challenge because there's a huge gap between, say, when the Gospels were written and, con and the contemporary person. Um, you know, and believing in miracles. Like I, I can, I can remember a, a lady in in the ice in the the uh, ICU of a hospital where I worked, um, and she said, to me, I, "I asked her, look, could I assist her because her husband was was dying, a serious accident." She says, "Look, it's not going to be a problem because I've got everyone in our church praying for him." Um, she was so hopeful and confident, but unfortunately he did die. And I think that's the dilemma. On the one hand, we want to believe in miracles. And yet on the other hand, there's a lot of doubt that, and scepticism about when and if miracles occur in our own experience. So we've got this huge gap between, say, our contemporary experience and the and the past, uh, the claims of the Gospels. We certainly, I don't think, we don't see miracles in our, in our, in today's society like it is claimed in the Gospels. And this is part of the problem. It's, it's not a part of our, our contemporary experience. That's what I think the real challenge is. Mm. Why we can ap appeal to eyewitness accounts and so on. It's persuading it's it's trying to persuade uh, people who we encounter that these miracles actually did happen and and uh, and if they're not real in their own experience it does create a lot of doubt i think there's always a, c a certain c uh, uh, amount of doubt mm. right, what do you what do people, what do people say about that There are a lot of people today who say that miracles do happen and that they have experienced miracles. The problem is that if you have not experienced miracles yourself or have, haven't seen them yourself, you then doubt. And that's just the common problem. It's not to say that they don't happen. It's just that um, we don't believe because we haven't experienced them ourselves. Well, that's exactly right. But, uh, so if we haven't experienced something ourselves, ourselves it's going to create an element of doubt. From what, what I've uh, read, I've, I've read people who said, um, uh, so authors that I really 
trust um, have said that they've, they've had a lot of activity in uh, praying for uh, the sick and for, um, and for miracles. And, and she said, sometimes it happens mm. and often it doesn't. And um, so, uh, um, like if you looked at the numbers across the world, it's probably quite large, but um, in terms of percentage in the experience, it's probably very small. And mm -hmm. so, um, like I, I share your, like I am loath to actually pray for the healing as uh, somebody to be healed, but in case they're disappointed. And I mean, I mean, like with that lady I just mentioned, hmm. I was wondering in my mind, of course, I wouldn't say it, uh, whether she was perhaps uh, setting herself up in such a way as she was developing a strong sense of false hope. Um, and that shouldn't knock your confidence in God, but at the same time, we have to, when someone's dying, we have to be realistic and, and find comfort, even in pain. Yeah, so... Um, um, but not necessarily seeing God only in the absolute supernatural miracle that we want. Yeah. Because often God doesn't give us that. I feel so we sort of have to in a way so God give me the grace to to deal with this experience even if it, even if this loved one dies help me give me the strength yeah. maybe that's where we need sometimes to find God rather than in the the sense of an, an absolute miracle where the person just dies against all the medical odds can I dip in a bit here? Sorry. I on? Yeah, go ahead, Gordon. Um, yeah, there, there's several things here. First, the, the scepticism that is sort of throughout our Western society is an obstacle to actually seeing some of these miracles. But there are other parts of the world where people do pray for people, uh, for others who are sick, injured and whatever, and they do recover. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one particular case, I, I read about it in a book um, called uh, Children and the Supernatural, I've got it here. Um, incredible accounts of things, of miracles that happened in Kenya. And I was, I read that and it seemed to me, uh, that any Western person will be very skeptical about that. They happened in an obscure part of Kenya. Now, as it happens, I was working in East Africa, so I made a detour after I finished my work and I went to this obscure part of Africa and I checked out the details of these miracles and I asked around and got not any, any number of eyewitness accounts of these miracles having happened. And it was true, they were verified again and again and again in a way that you would never expect to see in a Western skeptical society. That's the first thing. And the second thing is um, when we pray for someone to be healed, I think something that's missing a lot is if it is according to the Lord's will. Sometimes it is not according to the Lord's will for someone to be healed when we pray for them. Uh, and, and we're asking amiss because we're not sort of in the spirit. We, we, we don't really understand the, the perspective from which God's dealing with this. And so we, we pray for things, we, we ask for miracles and they don't happen. But they can happen. And if you actually read some of the great evangelists in, in China, in, in Indonesia, in uh, various parts of Africa, um, there are any number of accounts of modern day miracles. Which brings me to the first question that you posed, which is, um, I forget what the actual wording was, but something to do with them. Um, uh, total miracle, the assumption that uh, literal miracles are impossible. Therefore, there was this gigantic leap 
to the conclusion of total disbelief of the Gospels. Um, now, that to me is, uh, is a massive um, cavern, a, a gulf of, of missing logic in, in that leap from one to the other. You can't just go and say and assume, first of all, that miracles are impossible because if, if Jesus did it in particular, if he's the son of God, why shouldn't he be able to do the impossible? But even so, even if you assume that that apparent miracle was impossible, you can't jump to total disbelief because there are other things to consider. Um, yeah, I wasn't saying that. The nature uh, of the miracle might be quite different to what you had assumed. I, w I wasn't trying to say that miracles were impossible. I just said. No, no. But I, 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 I'm simply saying that it, that the the perceived lack of them in so many people's experience yeah. makes it very hard to believe in them. Quite so, but I, I was moving on from that to say that the... the it's not to say that logically they're not impossible because... I'm not saying you think that. I'm saying yeah. the form critics are saying that. They're, 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 mm. They make that initial assumption... Um, if I understood uh, Kevin correctly, they make that initial assumption that literal miracles are impossible. Uh, am yep. I right, Kevin? Did, yes. did, the, uh, did the form critics actually have a, uh, a, a methodical, logical progression to the conclusion of total disbelief in Gospels uh, in, and uh, in miracles? Or or, or did they just literally take that big step from... from yeah, because, well, they, they assumed that. They assumed that miracles were unhistorical. And okay. so, so the Gospels are unreliable. <laughs> well, you know, to me, I, I'm full of scepticism for this whole business of form criticism simply because that is naive. It's logically incomplete. You can't make that... that big leap that big assumption it, it's it just doesn't to follow it's just yeah. an assumption which arises out of their own prejudice well it may well be that germany at that time was full of that kind of prejudice but uh, yeah. you know if, if you don't address the argument rigorously and you make if you, and you miss out major parts of the argumentation then well, the credibility of, of your whole argument is kind of uh, battered, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I would have thought if God created the world, then I expect he'd be capable of performing a few miracles if he wanted to. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there are many interpretations of, of miracles, uh, and I'll be talking about some of these, um, where a miracle has occurred, but it may not be what superficially you think has occurred. You know, it may not be God doing the impossible. It may be God doing the extremely unlikely with incredible timing, incredible precision um, in line with his, uh, his, his progress of, of history. Mm. Um, personally, I've got a very dim view of uh, form criticism and, um, and other forms of criticism too of the Bible which are often from very apparently learned um, people and uh, who uh, have written at length. And I think they've done incredible amount of damage uh, to uh, the human, human beings, generally the, the modern world, because they've left the, um, the public with the impression that uh, all these things are just uh, mythical stories, just like uh, you know myths of other societies. That there's nothing really in it. That if there was any uh, basis to these stories, that they're very, very tiny and they've been um, embellished to the nth degree. And all these miracles never happened. The resurrection never happened, and everything else. And this is what's been left in the public mind. And nobody, or hardly anybody, is interested in hearing detailed arguments about uh, to counter those things, they just left with this uh, impression. So it's been, it's had a very 
a damaging effect upon um, human beings in our modern society uh, and have done for 100 years. And it's actually come out of a period of considerable ignorance and it really reflects their own prejudices. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you one uh, illustration of this. About, I think a lot of them came out of the late 1800s, if not this form of criticism, other forms of criticism. And that was in a time when it was generally believed that places like Nineveh were mythical, uh, Babylon, was mythical because they just said, well, these are just inventions like Troy. They also, although Troy is not in the Bible, of course, but they did believe that all these stories, these Greek stories about Troy were just, um, they were just made up. They were just legends, you know, um, to embellish their own personal um, view of themselves and everything. Well, then somebody went out there and actually dug up Troy Likewise, people have gone out there, archaeologists, and dug up Nineveh and Babylon and a host, hundreds and hundreds of other things. And while I do think that archaeology doesn't prove the Bible, you can't, it cannot do that, it's beyond its um, scope, but it does substantially corroborate the Bible. Now, a lot of these people uh, who came up with these higher critical views of the Bible lived at the time and absorbed that kind of view that, well, um, Babylon and Nineveh and all these other places were mythical and uh, all the kings of Israel and lots and lots of things like that, they were just mythical and it's since been disproved. But that's fed into their views that, as to how myths came about and how stories got embellished and there's no real history there at all. I think they've been extremely damaging and uh, there's not much of value in, in any of it, I don't think. So well, the problems we have, uh, implicit, uh, implicit um, problems, they disappear when people are, are less ignorant, people are more informed, when people yeah. understand better what things are, you know, what the conditions and social and uh, economic life was like in the Middle East in, in yeah. that time. Yeah. Um, so I think before we can really take any of this form criticism seriously, we have to first uh, examine in some depth what are the implicit assumptions that, that people are bringing to, to their arguments. Uh, because when we actually look at the, the assumptions, um, we need not look further any into their arguments because we can see the arguments are flawed right from the beginning. Yeah. A lot of it comes from what people want to believe. And once that is established, they then work out a reason for believing it and uh, yeah. build a structure around that to confirm them in their own beliefs. Absolutely. I mean, so much of, of uh, modern theology is based on the assumption that we have to uh, reinterpret the gospel stories to, to make it fit the modern narrative of our experiences. Uh, I can remember one feminist theologian, uh, Mary Daly, um, and she commented, for example, that the second coming would be reinterpreted as the rise of feminism. <laughs> right, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I think it had nothing to do, what, what I mean, such exegesis to impose it on the biblical text is just ridiculous, it's quite alien. Fine, and the same with black theology or liberation theology. They, they all do similar things. They sort of reinterpret, similar to Boltman, it's almost taking Boltman uh, in, in a sense uh, and reapplying it to interpret their particular experience. They're such a label. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a, a, a lot of it is an attack on the integrity of the original writers. Whereas we've got these documents, they, they actually do hang together, although it can be difficult for us to get into the culture of the time and uh, to know. And we, you know, this is where scholars, scholarly uh, exercises do come in as to well, what exactly do these words mean and what exactly are they saying here and there and everywhere. <laughs> but they're actually people of integrity who wrote these things uh, and they, like Luke explains how he, his own came about, um, they, they really are things that we should uh, 
they start off with having a great uh, respect for them. Um, because I think these other people come at it completely differently. You know, one thing... What, that they would say, what they would say is that, well, the ancient man, such as the, say, the, the writers of the Gospels uh, and the New Testament, uh, generally, they had a, a pre-scientific worldview. They didn't have the, the modern science that we have today. Um, one gentleman who I had a lot of argument with, theologian, he, he uh, said to me that if John Wesley was alive today, he would be a modernist because he, he lived in an era that was pre-scientific. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, how does he know that? <laughs> I realise that you didn't think of that line. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think we have to be careful about uh, elevating our own particular age. We say we live in the scientific age. Yes, we do. Does that mean that we know everything? There's a few things that science hasn't yet been able to explain. Like, for example, what exactly is light? What exactly is gravity? What exactly uh, holds the universe together? How exactly are atoms made up and things like that? Yeah, sure, we know certain things and we can you know, give laws for gravity and the force of gravity. And so what exactly is it? What exactly is electromagnetism? What yeah. exactly is consciousness? There's a whole bunch of questions like that, but the fact that there are scientific questions doesn't invalidate the fact that science is making progress about the, the nature of reality. Yeah, but we're not there yet, are we? We don't, we don't actually know no, everything yet, do we? Yet, but we yeah. are making useful yes. good progress. And as we know more, so we find out we there's so much more to know. And that's, that's been the case for a long time. You know, if we, people a thousand years ago were so ignorant that we have to ignore them, what are people a thousand years from now going to think about us? That's true too. So therefore, we should now, if we're sensible, adopt their thinking about us. That's right. But we are stupid and know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. What should we do about uh, these uh, kind of public uh, perceptions and prejudices? How can we approach it? Can we just throw yeah. our hands up in the air and say it's all? No, no, I think mm -hmm. you, you can try, you try but yeah. I think we have to be realistic. You can't expect necessarily to go in there and uh, you're going to change everyone's mind. You have to just uh, plant seeds. Oh. Yeah, and, and hopefully they'll bear fruit, and, and the trust in God to to work in people's That's lives. Yeah. Like Steve's example of C.S. Lewis. Yeah. That's right. I think here and there, um, you know, with God's blessing, some some people will uh, come to a, a new understanding and actually see Jesus for who he is and the gospels for what they are. But the vast bulk of people won't the vast bulk of people and, and form criticism and other forms of criticism have fed into this, um, you know, into the public mind. But then again, people hear what they want to hear. Don't they? It's always I mean, been like that. Jesus in his parable speaks, but you know, the different right. types of soil it depends on your state of mind, how you accept, that's right. Things. If you've got a heart of stone, you, yeah. you know, you won't listen. But I think we should be trying to respond to You're these trying. things. You try. You try. Yes, you, you yeah. lay the seeds. Yeah. Uh, and it's God who gives the increases. So. I think you've also got to, um, you know, what the Bible talks about how um, we will overcome this type of situation, A, by the word and also by the power of our testimony. Now, I think if you, I mean, in a Western society, I agree with what um, we were saying before that we don't see miracles as much as they do uh, in places like Africa or China. Um, there are just, uh, or um, in fact, some of the early church fa um, fathers in the you know, early 19th century might have seen a lot more miracles um, from a daily basis. But uh, I think we've all got our own personal stories that, um, where we where we can testify to the fact that we've felt that God has been involved in our lives. Um, I even had the case of my nephew, um, who lives in Adelaide. Uh, Fifteen years ago, he was at the time about eighteen years old. Uh, went for a run um, in the middle of the day. Doesn't normally go for a run in the middle of the day. Um, 
and um, they were living in the hills at the time. And um, uh, well, he had a cardiac arrest um, in pretty much in the middle of nowhere. There was houses on one side and bushland on the other. And um, a doctor who was on furlough happened to be in his house, in his office, and looking out his window and actually saw my nephew fall um, onto the pavement. Um, he's testified later to say that if he'd been uh, a minute before, if he'd gone out to get his coffee, he wouldn't have seen him because of the slope of the road. Um, and, his, um, and he ran out there and um, uh, proceeded to give um, my nephew um, cardiac massage. And this doctor's expertise was cardiac massage. Hmm. And um, he um, uh, eventually got people to attention and got um, people coming, but he basically gave um, my nephew cardiac massage for over 20, 30 minutes before the ambulance got there. And, um, and uh, he was put into an induced coma. Um, wow. his own um, heart defibrillator in his chest is one of the, about the 5% that survived these types of um, episodes. Um, and we all, you know, just from the whole circumstances, know that was a miracle. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty amazing one, but I think we've all got our own, you know, personal stories that we can bring into the conversation. Um, but I do think uh, bringing bringing it back to what what tonight's talking about, and that is that the Bible does present um, that it's not just written um, as a, just as theories or um, uh, stories. It's actually got some authenticity to it. Actually, I think what gives, it, I actually, um, what gives the Gospels a lot of authenticity is the actual scepticism that the disciples constantly expressed. That gives it that gives it some authenticity, because they themselves were struggling with belief in, in this Jesus. They did, yeah. And it's throughout the Gospels, Jesus is always rebuking them for their unbelief. Um, yeah, and and that in itself gives it authentic, some authenticity. It does, yeah. You know, I, I had one um, kind of dramatic answer to prayer. There's nothing miraculous about it. Um, I was having problems with my supervisor um, you know, being on a PhD scholarship and him wanting to use my PhD scholarship to work on his project instead of doing my PhD. And so uh, I explained my situation to the church uh, on the Sunday and um, said, What's the Christian response? Should I take this, put up with it, or should I confront him and um, um, uh, and say, uh, no, I need to actually work on my PhD and uh, defy him? So is it best to comply or to uh, speak up and stand up? So like to be or not to be. And so uh, I said this before the church and asked them, to pray for me, uh, to grant me wisdom. And so they prayed over me to grant me wisdom to pray on, uh, on how I should actually respond and give me wisdom for it. Well, I rolled up to work on Monday morning and I was none the wiser. So I would continue with my work for the first hour and uh, not knowing what to do. And next thing I know, my um, boss kind of marched into my um, compartment where I was and he says I've made a decision I've decided that you should actually work on your PhD and um, <laughs> I said wow God didn't answer my prayer he didn't give me wisdom <laughs> but uh, what happened was even better so um, next Sunday I went to church and so I had all these people ask me um, what happened did we as boss your prayer answered so I got up in um uh, 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 front of the church and I explained, look, um, last week Gary um, asked that I should get wisdom 
um, to know what to say, and your prayer was utterly useless. Um, <laughs> I had, I was none the wiser, uh, but God did something in <laughs> instead. So, all right, so there was uh, no, um, I didn't have my uh, missing leg restored or anything like that, but it, no. was, it was quite dramatic. So it's, it's kind of what Gordon said. Uh, it's uh, God's timing through natural means. Yeah. Mm. Just thinking about you had three questions you finished with there, Kevin. Do you have those handy? Uh, yeah, that was quite handy for me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the first question was uh, what um, uh, Gordon was referring to. Um, yep. I could share my screen. and. Um, uh, bring them across. There they are. Can you see them? Right. Yep. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Was it reasonable for the form critics to dismiss miracles? I think we discussed that. Yep. Oh, yeah. How is knowledge of um, biblical criticism, such as form criticism, how's that helpful to us now? I think we've had one or two speakers at Reasonable Faith in past years who discussed this sort of thing a bit, and they said that. Uh, some of the mechanisms involved do allow us to come to a better understanding of the scriptures and of the events that actually happened that they can actually help us if we use the tools properly. Uh, that is, without having preconceived assumptions such as miracles are impossible. And so if we do know form criticism and these forms of criticism, they can help us to get a deeper knowledge of uh, what it actually was. Hmm. Well, I think there's nothing wrong with identifying uh, different genres of passages in the Bible. Mm. Mm. That's fair enough. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you can uh, analyse it um, or make whatever what you use you want to make of it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But your very last question there, I think given that they are claims to be based on eyewitness testimony and claims that were apparently accepted at the time, the onus of proof is on those who say that we shouldn't rather than those who say that we should accept that claim of for eyewitness. Hmm. 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 I, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, well, you, you can uh, kind of understand people's scepticism. These people report miracles. I don't see miracles like that this day. So should I actually believe them? I can actually understand um, why they would... Um, cast out on it. Like I was reading um, one particular uh, book by a mythicist and um, he looking, commenting on Luke's prologue, he said that that is just a bald faced lie. And um, well, I don't, I don't believe him. I, I believe uh, uh, Luke has integrity. Um, but Did he have any basis for his claim or was that just a bald faced statement? It was a bald faced statement. No, nothing to support it. Just his prejudice. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, because um, the book was called Did Jesus uh, Exist or Debate, Debate Among Atheists? So he was writing for an atheistic audience. So an atheistic audience would presume that miracles are impossible. So this guy reported miracles, so he's a liar. I think from our careful reading of the Gospels and indeed of the whole Bible, but um, uh, more and more, um, it strikes strikes me as to how um, how wonderful they are, and how um, how much it rings true. Uh, even the way it's written, that where it's not written in an exaggerated uh, form. E even I mean, just recently I've been reading about the crucifixion and sharing about that with others, mm. and it's not written in a um, a highly it's written in a matter of fact kind of way that's even subdued if anything yes it's not it's not glamorized it's not well you wouldn't glamorize you know what i mean it's like not, the passion of christ by um the film yeah. that's uh sex it up and it exaggerates or um, yeah. focuses on the blood and guts and all this sort of thing that's right and, uh, and doesn't the gospel involve... writers don't do that the gospel writers don't do that and and all the way through you know whether it's about miracle or whether it's not it's written in such a way that it's, um, it just rings true the way they write, um, given that it's a different, really different culture. I know we've got this huge time difference and cultural difference between those writers and ourselves, but it ring, rings true. And the more I read, and I read all the time, I read, and I read carefully, um, it, it just rings true. And you find that 
uh, often people who are so critical of these things hardly even know what they're talking about. They, have, yeah. they, they don't read, read it, they don't look. They've read the critics, so they've absorbed the critics' views, um, but they don't know the source itself at all. Coming back to C.S. Lewis, who Stephen was talking about earlier, um, he wrote that uh, from his knowledge of how these things are written, as Steve explained, um, the Gospels and the way the Bible is written is just nothing like you would write if you were making it up. It's totally contrary to what anyone would make up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I can agree. I can believe that. And another thing about these, these original documents, I mean, some people take this as a form of criticism. They say, well, they're uh, anonymous. These documents are anonymous. Yeah, well, the later ones that were trying to be passed off as uh, genuine Gospels, yeah, they've all got names on them, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, and things like that. But the original ones, um, they, they don't have any names on them because um, they didn't think to put their name on it. They didn't, they're just writing what was, what was actually uh, that they knew of, you know. Later ones, uh, the, the false gospels and that, they got names on them. Mm -hmm. You're right about the authors didn't put their names on them, but the church seemed to know because... That's right too. Right from the very earliest times, those names were attached to those gospels and there were never any other names attached to them. That's, that's true too. Quite right. Sorry, just Kevin, just a quick one on the, the Passion of the Christ. I found, yes, the brutal scenes of the scourging and the crucifixion itself very, very confronting. But I think in our age, we don't know. I mean, when those Gospels were written, most people of that time would have known what a scourging really looked like. Yeah. They would have known what a crucifixion looked like. I think we have so sentimentalised and we don't see hangings anymore. We don't see anything else. Yeah. I think the Passion of the Christ did a great service. I think it might too. How yeah. brutal it was. And, and uh, I think it was Isaiah who says his face shall be uh, disfigured uh, more than any other man's. And I think that was a very powerful portrayal of yeah. what that prophecy ended up being because we saw what a true Roman scourging was like. We yeah. saw what a true crucifixion was like. And we in our very uh, sentimental and uh, uh, what's the right word, um, sanitized age have no real idea of what it was like to go through those punishments. Yeah. Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't watch it because my overweak stomach. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, just a, just a comment on, on the miracles part. Um, I think that, you know, most people um, get over most illnesses, even life-threatening ones, most of the time, either with medical intervention or without. And, and for us to go uh, deciding um, what of that is a miracle or not is, is probably arrogant and silly because um, we're just not qualified to make that call. And I think that uh, we wander through life completely unaware of most of the threats to us. Um, we're a bit like babies day out, you know, we wander through and, and most of the time we're looked after and kept safe. But there's a lot of miraculous stuff going on there to keep us that way. And, and I think we need to be aware of the miracles that we don't see as much as the ones that are in our face. Yeah. Yeah. But we take it for granted. Mm. And it happens so commonly. So, mm. Um, getting back to, um, Sorry, go on. I just make a point about the when what Jeff was talking about the um, when people were alluding to the fact that the gospels are stories, um, the fact that in old the Old Testament time or uh, well, in the New Testament times the women weren't considered um, reliable eyewitnesses, yet the women were the ones that were the first eyewitnesses. Yeah. So if, if you were going to make up a story and make it look um, or try and make it legitimate. You wouldn't put women as the first lip, uh, the first eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. I just think little things like that sort of show that it is actually an account of what happened. Yeah. yeah. So, and if you were writing stories to uh, put the church in a good position, you know, the early church and the leaders of the church, like Peter, and so on, would you include all the stories about what Peter did and how he denied Jesus? Uh, 
three times at that critical moment? And would you have all these other stories about the apostles? I don't think so. How do you have little faith? Actually, in response to your comment, a professor once said to me um, that uh, the writer of Acts didn't know uh, about the uh, claims of the woman about Jesus' appearances because they're not mentioned. Other events, other, uh, that's what he claimed. Mm. Well, Luke and his gospel is the same author. In, uh, in, in Acts. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying, he said, but he said the writer of Acts, he didn't say Luke, mm. he said the writer of Acts didn't mention the appearances uh, of Jesus to the woman. So he questioned uh, whether or not uh, you know, this is a really early tradition. Uh, this is a really, uh, you know, this, the, these claims might have come somewhat later. Mm. That's what he thought. Yeah, Paul didn't mention the women. Uh, yeah, see, so, so that's an issue. Arguments from absence are always dangerous. Uh, right. Just further about uh, the Acts of the Apostles, you mentioned the we passages. It's interesting how they happen um, you, because the casual reader, or yeah, myself and reading it, you could easily miss that. You could oh, read yeah. the whole story and not notice that it goes from they to we to they, you know, at different places. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so incidental to the, um, to the, to the whole book. Mm -hmm. um, and that too is a bit of a mark of truth that he, that Luke is there on these occasions and he's not there on other occasions. And it all sort of hangs together. It makes sense. Mm. But it's completely and then, and then, the, um, then a lot of the, the parts that are we, uh, there's a lot of detail there that, that really sounds like it's an eyewitness, whereas the parts he's not there, um, it's, it's summarised more briefly. Is that yeah. right? Okay. In, 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 in Acts 20, um, uh, the first four verses, so Paul going from, Turkey through Macedonia to um, Corinth, yeah. and um, during that time, um, Paul wrote two Corinthians and Romans, and major things happen, and he skims over it in uh, oh, yeah. uh, four verses, and then uh, when you come back, he comes back, picks up Luke in Philippi, and you get this uh, holiday account of all the spaces that they actually visited, and all the detail at which nothing happened. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so he, he actually goes in a whole pile of detail when he was there yeah. and skims over major events when he's not. Yeah. And um, so it, it's also happened so nonchalantly as well. Like, yeah. uh, like I've known of people who've studied Acts for a whole year and never noticed the wee passages. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But... It, uh, the other thing about um, I, I, this is one one of my band workers. Um, so uh, the we passages actually start in uh, Acts 16, where um, Paul goes through uh, Troas, and the, the we passages go from Troas to Philippi, mm -hmm. and then he's in jail and they stop. And then there's um, um, several years pass, and you come out to Acts 20. Uh, it actually occurs when he comes back through Philippi. <laughs> mm. So he dropped off um, uh, Luke in Philippi, uh, went all over the place, came through Philippi, and the wee passages start. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same place, uh, place where they stop. Yeah. So it, it, it hangs together very nicely. But the author doesn't draw any attention to that. No. Or well, does he? It's just completely oh. incidental. Mm. Um, it's just a sign that it, this is a truthful account. Yeah. But if you haven't, uh, just go uh, and examine uh, Acts from uh, Acts 16 to, mm -hmm. through to the end and uh, um, identify and pick it up. Watch mm -hmm. it there, it's really obvious. And watch the video of Kevin's talk. Yes, yes <laughs> exactly. I, I'd like to get my numbers up on the YouTube site, please. Oh, righty Eh? Can I make a quick comment on, uh, what's the word I want, social storying, um, ver history versus uh, folklore? Yep. The, the classic introduction for us, I think, is, and uh, 
once upon a time immediately flags what? A fairy tale. A fairy yeah. tale. There's, so they're basically set up within a, a social system to flag, this is fairy tale, enjoy it. Um, there are other introductions that say, you better take notice of this, this is fact. Um, and I think this is flagged to a certain extent in our New Testament as well. Hmm. Yeah, m most of the Bible account is uh, com is very much rooted in history, um, more so than any other holy book, um, you know, more so than uh, the Quran and certainly other major world religions, their holy books. The Bible is really, a large part of it, um, most of it is extremely historically based and it's bringing that out all the time and it's uh, in the way it's written. Yeah. Uh, Don, um, you spent, spent a lot of time in New Guinea. Um, what was the situation there like? Um, uh, Gordon described things happening in Kenya. Did every, uh, things similar to that happen in New Guinea? Be a bit more specific, please. Let me, let me say, the people we were working with, Mami, were definitely or had oral tradition with a few who had been educated and uh, were, were able to read and follow that. But basically, as soon as they went home, they were back, in, back into pure oral function. Hmm. I was referred to, referring to the occurrence of mir miracles, like um, were, were uh, did you see miraculous things in New Guinea at all? Nothing that knocked me over. Um, mm. The comments of uh, stuff in the background, I was a little concerned, the comment um, about the fact that we're looked after and uh, it's so easy. Um, let me tell you, that's not the case in Papua New Guinea. The number of people that don't survive, um, what we would consider very minor difficulties, um, it's, the, it's, it's the other side of the coin. Mm. Um, a simple scratch, um, there are as a worst case might be, well, I better get some antibiotic cream on that or some betadine or something. For them, it's life-threatening because there is no antibiotic cream, there is no betadine, and you're in trouble. Hmm. Or even some clean water. Yeah, well, drinking water is a, a perennial. Um, hmm. There are social norms of how you, where you get water from to drink, etc. But by the same token, if you happen to be in a, a downstream village, you get a lot after it's been uh, processed uh, bodily and otherwise upstream. Hmm. Mm. Hey, can I just uh, say something further? You were just mentioning in, in relation to that about um, oral tradition and that. Um, I think that um, scholarship has uh, tended to show that some societies, many societies around the world that are basically an oral uh, society, that the, the stories that are important to them can be preserved extremely accurately over a long period of time, over generations. I actually think that the gospel records uh, were written very soon after the, those events. For example, none of them, none of the gospels clearly um, um, describe the events of AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. That it is in Jesus Olivet prophecy, but it's had, it, had that been written after the event, I think, uh, I think people, uh, people expect that, uh, it would have made more the reference to the destruction of Jerusalem clearer than it than it uh, comes out there. That's obviously we can see Jesus had predicted it, but um, Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, etc. But 
you could expect it would be written more completely and more in more detail uh, if it was written back into the uh, story. So it was not like that. I actually think all the gospel accounts were written very early and that makes sense that they would be given the importance uh, of the events um, and the, the, the characters in their society who could have the education and the means to do, to, to preserve such writing. People like Luke, like Matthew and others. But uh, even if it is oral tradition, uh, the whole concept of Chinese whispers, um, I mean, that's based on a, a, on a party game, isn't it? Where you have some, some statement that's made that doesn't bear any relation to anything real anyway. It's just, uh, so it's not in any context. Some statements whispered in someone's ears and then that person whispers in the next person's ears against the background of a lot of noise and happiness and so on. And then after it's gone through 20 people, you end up with something that bears no relationship to what started with. And it's a terrible kind of um, picture to paint and say, well, uh, the oral tradition that was, if there was such an oral tradition behind the Gospels, was anything like that. Um, societies that have oral tradition are very careful to preserve accurately. I, believe, I understand, I haven't got anything to present here, but uh, over generations even, they preserve very accurately the stories that matter to them. Yes. We also need to be careful when we're talking about an oral society that we do not assume that means an illiterate society. Yeah. Um, they were definitely a literate society. They just were not a literary society. Um, they didn't have printing presses. They didn't have loads of books all over the place. So they had to use oral tradition as much as they could, um, yeah. but they could still write and record things and had been able to for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. That was then coming out of Papua New Guinea where a literary, a literary society was non-existent until uh, the good old colonials came in. Um, you would basically, a society or a community, mark people, you will be our storyteller. Yeah. And basically the comment was, on a rainy day, for example, we will sit in our houses and we will tell stories. And if you're telling stories, fine, however, as we found with our small children. You tell a story and it doesn't have the right emphasis, doesn't have the right ending, they jump up and down and say, no, you're wrong. <laughs> tell it properly. And this is exactly what happens there. That's right. Yeah, you know, I did that. Um, tell stories to my grandchildren and then um, you do it uh, fast and uh, it's rhythmic and all this sort of thing. And you deliberately change a word and. Uh, oh. um, <laughs> and they go berserk. <laughs> yeah. But isn't it also the case that in modern society, it's very difficult to uh, to maintain this uh, this oral tradition because our brains are all yeah. every day under a deluge of information, multimedia information, so much information that it's almost impossible to. Uh, to, to isolate one little bit of, uh, of written word and memorize it. Mm -hmm. But in years past, it was much easier to do. They weren't deluged with massive amounts of information. And look, for example, at the Islamic world where they have um, Quran uh, recital competitions. And you don't even enter the, that kind of competition, unless you know ad verbatim, word for word, the entire Quran from page one to, to the end. Uh, it can be done, it has been done, um, even in the Muslim worlds, it's still being done now, but it's becoming less and less easy. Mm. You're, not, you're going to learn the Bible, Gordon. Sorry? You're going to oh, memorize the entire Bible. <laughs> Probably a nice boy. A bit of a put down, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just having a joke, not a put down. I have met somebody who had memorized most of the New Testament and was finishing it off, although admittedly this particular person was in a Muslim country. Yeah. Oh. It's funny. This... I wouldn't enter such a competition only. I wouldn't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> I. It's funny, I asked a little 
boy today, his name's Muhammad, <laughs> what his name meant, right? <laughs> He's a Muslim. And he said he didn't know. <laughs> I, you know, I just thought it was quite bizarre, really, because it's their prophet's name. I said, it's after a prophet. You're named after a prophet. <laughs> but after. he technically should know. But it was just funny. Yeah. Because I take it so seriously. One serious. of the strange things about these uh, Quran reciting competitions, they can recite everything, but ask them how much of it they actually understand. <laughs> you get a very different answer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's very, yeah. 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 Um, okay. Well, then, um, I might just um, um, pause or stop the recording now because um, I think we've had sufficient discussion. Um, but anyway, thank you very much you. Um, for all your attention. And um, I'll stop the recording and then you can just have some informal.